Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Harvard Classic Lectures. We are now in lecture number 97, Shelley's Defense of Poetry. We are in volume number 27, English Essays, and this is one of the essays at the conclusion of that volume published in 1840. Now, of course, this is, as we've said many times in 303, this is one of the sacred texts of 303. We'll try to understand a little bit better why that's the case in our close now study of this text. We've mentioned it in all kinds of lectures uh, before. Now we actually turn to this one. And of course, um, we should point out right away, this, is, uh, this essay is in, in the tradition, in the long tradition, that probably does begin with Aristotle's Poetics and moves right up the way, you know, to present day in the 20th century, late 20th century, Sisoff Miso's Treatise on Poetry. But certainly this is one of the great essays of all time, so we want to spend a little time with it. Now, it is a response, published in 1840 by Mary Shelley but after his death, but it is a response to an essay by his pal Thomas Love Peacock, uh, The Four Ages of Poetry, as it's referred to. We'll get more into this in 1820. Now, in some ways, we're back to the previous lecture in the Harvard Classics folder that you can find there at learnstrong.net, down the left-hand side in the Harvard Classics folder. Um, that is to say, lecture number 96, Sydney's Defense of Posey. And again, the question of what is the value of poetry is we have sometimes, you know, kind of choked about it in 303. If, I mean, if you really want to understand the ranking of poetry as opposed to any other discipline, just go home this evening and sit down with your folks and say, I've decided that I know what I'm going to major in in college. Instead of going into pre-med or engineering, I've decided I'm going to major in poetry. And you'll probably get the same response that Dante's father gave him when Dante said he wasn't going into law, and that is, no, you'll never be remembered. Of course, today we don't worry so much about fame. We worry more about fortune. That is to say, you're not going to make any money. But it's a fair question to ask, why is that the case? Like, why is it that if I major in poetry at the university, the chances of me making bank are not as good as if I major in engineering or pre-med or something in the sciences? Now, why is that? Well, I think that a lot of that has to do with our misunderstanding or our non-understanding of an essay like this, The Defense of Poetry. Let's go ahead now and just provide a real brief uh, plot summary, or, uh, a biography of Shelley. Of course, we've spoken about Shelley in other lectures on LearnStrong.net. In the Senior B folder, we've talked about Ozymandias, we've talked about Ode to the Westman, we've talked about To a Skylark. In all three of those, uh, we tried to comment on how those poems are in some ways literal validation of what Shelley has to say in defense of poetry. His dates, 1792 to 1822, of course, that tragic uh, drowning off a, from a boat wreck in 1822. Um, he was found with some uh, poetry of Keats in his pocket. There is some notion that because of the quarantine, he was, he was burned on the uh, beach there. And Mary Shelley supposedly reached into his chest and brought out his, his heart and kept it for the rest of her life. Um, whether that kind of stuff is true or not, we love to tell stories like that, right? Because they're, they're awfully fun. He was a, what we would call, really, by today, a philosophic poet. And we're going to see some of that in our, in our study, in our close reading of, of this essay. Um, he was, without question, a radical, um, in almost all ways, certainly radical in his, in his personal choices, his sexual choices, obviously a radical in terms of the work that he did poetically. It's interesting that um, he, uh, he's, not, he's not well known in his lifetime. I mean, we've got that famous story in 1816 when he and Mary Wollstonecraft, who will become later Mary Shelley, the, the, the author of Frankenstein, of course, ends up with Lord Byron in Geneva on the lake, and they're having all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And, of course, she says that she kind of invented the idea of her, of her novel Frankenstein from that time. His influence, though, Shelley's influence, is really impressive. I mean, everybody from Tolstoy to Thoreau and civil disobedience and Marx, of course, had, had influences on Gandhi and MLK as well. From the political side, from the poetic side, I mean, his, his influence is prodigious. After his death, very much like his pal Keats, after his death, all kinds of people are going to jump on board. We, we can think just of, of uh, Yeats. And um, I've always argued, and, and I'll even try and make the argument here in this lecture, that uh, T.S. Eliot was influenced by, by Shelley, and especially by this defense of poetry. Um, in many ways, um, Eliot spent his life to argue against much of what's in uh, defense of poetry, and yet at the same time, I think he was very influenced. I've got a few lines that I'm going to try and share with you, uh, you guys, to show you that. 
Well, let's talk a little bit more about background information. Like we said, in 1920, Peacock's um, um, article, The Four Ages of Poetry, argued ostensibly that poetry had, had reached its nadir and was, and was kind of useless because we're now in a modern age, the age of science, which is, of course, why if you go home and say, I'm going to major in poetry, your folks will say something like, poetry is fine, you know, you can write poetry on the side, but let's get a real degree and a real job, right? Um, Shelley uh, actually said that, it, that it, the, the essay, um, he said about the essay that it was clever, but he said he, he, he thought it was false. And then to Peacock he wrote, um, your anathemas against poetry, I'm not quoting, it self-excited me to a, this sounds very much like Shelley, a sacred rage. I have the greatest possible desire to break a lance with you in honor of my mistress Urena, of course, the, the muse, right? A defense of poetry, of course, published ultimately. Um, now, John Hunt did some editing after his death, and Shelley's uh, wife, Mary Shelley, in 1840, published this one in Essays, Letters from Abroad, Translations and Fragments. Now, let's just give a general overview of the arguments that Shelley will make in defense of poetry, okay? Um, first of all, we should point out that Shelley is, of course, part of the second generation romantic poets. We've given full lectures on this at LearnStrong.net in the Senior B folder. And he's part of that uh, Byron to precede him and then Keats to follow him in the order in which we discuss them in those lectures. Shelley will begin in defense of poetry commenting on ethical science and the ways in which it arranges the elements which poetry has created. Now, Shelley, like Keats, was a firm believer in the idea that the most important thing in our life is poetry, and the most important people in the history of civilization are poets. Now, this might seem a radical idea until you expand the definition of poetry to include all kinds of things, for example, movies, songs, video games, videos themselves, pretty much anything that you might want to watch on YouTube for Shelley could qualify, could qualify as a poem. And poets are the ones who make that stuff. In other words, for Shelley, the greatest creative artists, he will simply call poets and their product and the work that will then, in fact, inform the world poetry. Now, when you, in, when you become so inclusive in your thinking about the arts, then all of a sudden Shelley's idea is not so radical at all. Okay. Now, in defense of poetry, he's going to argue that the, first of all, invention of language is huge, right? It reveals, obviously, there's this need humans have to reproduce, you know, ordered and rhythmic uh, understandings that lead ultimately to a certain kind of harmony and unity. I mean, think about it. We've said this before. And if you walk out of 303 and you hear some loud music playing, for example, in the comments area, isn't it fascinating that you naturally are attracted to go to it? For example, in the mall, those wretched things that Shelley would have had serious problems with, as we've economists have commented about Wordsworth, and the world is too much with us. But if you go to a mall, if you, if you hear music somewhere or rhythm of any kind, notice how you and pretty much everybody else has a natural tendency to say, dude, what is that sound? And then you start following it. Isn't that fascinating? In other words, Shelley says, it is natural for us from the time we're almost born, maybe even before we're born, we love issues of rhythm because it provides us with some sense of harmony. And of course, harmony is unity, and this, of course, delights us, right? And instinctively, it leads to certain kinds of creative activities. He says it in this way, every man in the infancy of art observes an order which approximates more or less closely to that from which highest delight results, end quote. He'll call this faculty of approximation that allows, for example, those of us who pay attention to our experiences um, to enjoy, quote, he says, a relation between the highest pleasure and its causes, right? And he will go on to say that these poets who possess this faculty, right, um, uh, have it in excess. And it's their job, it's their pleasure to communicate these experiences to the community, right? Now, he doesn't claim necessarily that language is poetry, right? Uh, language is necessarily the medium of poetry, but to have to be, right? The creation of a language uh, to certain kinds of understanding of poetics, order, unity, harmony, things like this. A desire, obviously, to, 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 to share, to delight 
right in the beautiful, and we'll have we'll have much to say about that. Of course, we appreciate, don't we? He will call it the true and the beautiful, right? Uh, and this is very close to our integral philosophy of Ken Wilber: the good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, and this has a powerful social aspect. In other words, he will argue that our notions of what's right and what's wrong within a culture, what's valued and what's not valued in a culture, and what should be valued, is all contingent on our poets and their poetry, their production. In some ways, when we say in 303 that we are the stories we tell, the stories we retell, the stories we accept, and of course the stories that we decide to reject, either individually or as a culture, really we're speaking um, Shelley language from the defense of poetry. It's, it, I call it, I say stories, but obviously easily we could call them poems, right? Of course, Homer comes to mind immediately. Is this all of the great ones? We're going to get the litanies, these great lists in defense of poetry, and of course it's going to be Homer, and then from Homer it's going to be Shakespeare, and then of course Milton, and to that degree, there, there's your important list, right, of, of uh, T.S. Eliot and the greatest writers and all of that, and Dante obviously falls into that list as well. Now, of course, the, um, the poetry will get directly involved, for Shelley, with social uh, activities and, 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 and the mores within a, within a society. Now, what's even more fascinating is that Shelley will define poets as people like Plato and Christ, um, who are, I mean, we normally don't think of them as poets, and yet for Shelley, and this is what makes his essay so profound, these are, these are really influential people for Shelley, and in many ways, Shelley would argue that Plato and Christ are the two arbiters of Western thought. It's an interesting idea. Finally, um, he will finish with the, uh, a line that's going to be one that we'll talk about. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Um, he, he will talk about the profound ambiguity inherent in linguistic means, which uh, is considered at once an instrument of intellectual freedom and a vehicle for political and social subjugation. This uh, coming from a, from a quote of a scholar. And this is a, this is a fascinating idea. Let's, Let's turn now to defense of poetry. Enough talking about it. Let's actually enjoy it. Uh, this was one of the only really famous prose pieces of Shelley. Most of everything he wrote, he wrote poetically. But really, honestly, and you'll hear this when I read it, I mean, his, his rhythms, even in his prose, are quite remarkable and beautiful. He opens with these lines in the second paragraph. Poetry, in a general sense, may be defined to be the expression of the imagination, quote, unquote. And poetry is cunning with the origin of man. Man is an instrument, and obviously when he uses the word man, he means all humans, right? Man is an instrument over, over which a series of external and internal impressions are driven, um, which uh, will begin right away this notion of mind versus reason, as he will introduce it. A few lines later, he says, man in society, with all his passions and his pleasures, next becomes the object of the passions and pleasures of man. An additional class of emotions produces an augmented treasure of expressions and language, gesture, and the, immediate, and the imitative arts become at once the representation and the medium, the pencil and the picture, the chisel and the statue, the chord and the harmony, the social sympathies, or those laws from which, as from its elements, society results begin to develop themselves from the moment that two human beings coexist. The future is contained within the present, as the plant, within the seed. Now, of course, as I said already, I think T.S. Eliot was more influenced by lines like this than maybe he even he realized. His opening lines of Burton Norton, time present and time past, are both perhaps present and time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable. What might have been is an abstraction remaining a perpetual possibility only in a world of speculation. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. Sounds very much like Shelley's lines here, right? And he says, equality, diversity, unity. I mean, these are, the, these are the words that, of course, from Shelley on will become really kind of what we think of when we think about progressive ideas that find their way into po uh, political discourse, still is the case today, right? Mutual dependence become the principles alone capable of affording the motives according to which the will of a social being is determined to action inasmuch as he is social, and constitute pleasure and sensation, virtue and sentiment, beauty and art, truth and reasoning, love and the intercourse of kind. Hence, men, ever in the infancy of society, observe a certain order in their words and actions distinct from that 
of the objects and the impressions represented by them, all expression being subject to the laws of that from which it proceeds. And uh, of course, I, would, I, I, could, I could read all of this and I would love to, but I don't have time, so I'm going to have to skip now and we keep going into the next paragraph. He says it this way, those in whom it exists in excess are poets, that is to say pleasure, highest pleasure, right? In the most universal sense of the word, in the pleasure resulting from the manner in which they express the influence of society or nature upon their own minds, communicates itself to others and gathers a sort of reduplication from that community. Their language is vitally metaphorical, that is to say, one thing representing or compared to another thing. That is, it marks the before unapprehended relations of things and perpetuates their apprehension until the words which represent them become, through time, signs for portions or classes of thoughts instead of pictures of integral thoughts. And we love, of course, that he uses the word integral. No question, he was an integral thinker, a synthetic thinker, all the way through his life. A few lines later, he, by the way, mentions several times uh, Lord Bacon as being uh, one of his great favorite poets. And this is weird because we normally don't think the day of Bacon is poet. We think of him as philosopher. We think of him as scientist. Of course, we've given lectures on a lot of Lord Bacon's stuff as well as, uh, as of studies in particular. But here, Shelley will say, no, 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 he's a poet. He will, he will say it this way just a few lines later. But poets are those who imagine and express this indestructible order are not only the authors of language and of music, of the dance and architecture, of the statuary and painting, they are the institutors of laws and the founders of civil society and the inventors of the arts of life and the teachers who draw into a certain propriety with the beautiful and the true, that partial apprehension of the agencies of the invisible world, which is called religion. So in other words, it's a big tent for Shelley. One of the reasons that we love him as an integral thinker is that you know, he will argue, along with a philosopher like Ken Wilber, no human mind is capable of 100% error. And to that degree, we're going to bring a lot of people under the tent of Shelley talking about the power of the poetic vision. He will continue by talking about mirrors and clouds and the like, but, and to that degree sounding very much like Aristotelian views and poetics. But then he'll say it this way. He's making distinctions between prose and poetry. We, we, we're familiar with that famous line, right, of Sheslav Misha that we love in 303 at the very beginning of Treatise on Poetry, where he talks about one good poetic line can carry a whole wagon full or a whole cart full of prose. But we've got an interesting idea here from Shelley. Watch this. He, he says, the distinction between poets and prose writers is a vulgar error. The distinction between philosophers and poets has been anticipated. Plato was essentially a poet. The truth and splendor of his, image, of his imagery and the melody of his language are the most intense that it is possible to conceive. Go back and look at our lectures on Plato in, at LearnStrong.net, and we make a very similar argument. Of course, the irony is that in the supposed ideal republic in, in the republic that Plato decides to create, he would be the poet that's first jettisoned or thrown out, right? Um, poetry uh, here for Plato. He, Plato, rejected the measure of the epic, dramatic, and lyrical forms because he sought to kindle a harmony in thoughts divested of shape and action, and he forbore to invent any regular plan of rhythm which could include under determinate forms the varied pauses of his style. And of course, his dialogues are, we have said many times, like beautiful constructed poetry. I mean, think about the Mino um, as just one classic example of that, the back and forth in the exchange. I mean, we could go on and on about that. And, and we have in other lectures, right? A few lines later, he says, all the authors of revolutions, and of course Shelley was very much interested in revolutions, uh, in opinion, are not only necessarily poets as they are inventors, nor even as their words unveil the permanent analogy of things by images which participate in the life of truth, but as their periods are harmonious and rhythmical and contain in themselves the element of verse, being the echo of the eternal music. I mean, just back to those lines I was quoting from T.S. Eliot's uh, Burt Norton, those opening lines, my words echo thus in your mind, uh, but to what purpose this serving of the dust on a bowl of rose leaves I do not know. Other echoes inhabit the garden, shall we follow? This notion of the echo, I think 
you know, this is a compelling idea, and I think T.S. Eliot was probably very influenced by this idea. Nor are the, those supreme poets who have employed traditional forms of rhythm on account of their form and action of their subjects less capable of perceiving and teaching the truth of things than those who have omitted that form. And then he gives the big three. Shakespeare, Dante, Milton, to confine ourselves to modern writers, our philosophers of the very loftiest power. He'll say a few lines later, a story of particular facts is as a mirror which obscures and distorts that which should be beautiful. Poetry is a mirror which makes beautiful that which is distorted. Now, I love that idea, and we think of Sylvia Plath's famous poem, Mirror, don't we? But, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to think about the influence of an idea like this. What poetry does is it shows us things that we are so accustomed to. I comment on this in my study of To a Skylark. But all of a sudden, the song of the Skylark is radically different again. Go back and take a look at that. He says it this way. Poetry is ever accompanied with pleasure. Now, we'll talk about a little bit later how sometimes pleasure also involves pain, as we saw in our study of to a, to a Skylark. All spirits on which it falls open themselves to receive the wisdom which is mingled with its delight. In the infancy of the world, neither poets themselves nor their auditors are fully aware of the excellence of poetry. For it acts in a divine and unapprehended manner beyond and above consciousness, and it's reserved for future generations to contemplate and measure the mighty cause and effect and all the strength and splendor of their union. Even in modern times, it's fascinating, he keeps using this term modern, you'll remember that the subtitle of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was the modern Prometheus. This use of the word modern, Shelley was very, uh, I mean, he was very much tuned into the idea that he was living in a very modern time, of course, both for good as well as for ill, right, as the Industrial Revolution. Even in modern times, no living poet ever arrived at the fullness of his fame, certainly Shelley did not. The jury which sits in judgment upon a poet, belonging as he does to all time, must be composed of his peers. It must be impaneled by time from the selectus of the wise of many generations. A poet, and this is beautiful given what we know about Keats and his famous to a nightingale, a poet is a nightingale who sits in darkness and sings to cheer its own solitude with sweet sounds. His auditors are as men entranced by the melody of an unforeseen musician who feel that they are moved and soft.